here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. My guest today is Chad Sloner, head of iShares US product at BlackRock. We're talking about the outlook and investing strategies for the second quarter. Chad, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, happy to be here. Excited to be talking with you today at the end of the first quarter. It's been a quarter it's been. Right, right. Uh, it's been quite an interesting quarter. So I wanted to start with your thoughts on the recent market performance. And uh, markets have been volatile, which is not surprising since there's so much going on. Uh, Reddit rebellion, SPACs, NFTs, Bitcoin, then chaos caused by Archego. Uh, but there are many reasons to be optimistic uh, particularly the U.S. vaccine rollout is very encouraging. It is accelerating, and that is why the economy is expected to rebound strongly later this year, which will boost cyclical areas of the market. And that's why we have seen this powerful rotation into cyclical stocks and ETFs. So talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on the recent market action. Sure. So. Um you know, as I was reflecting and preparing for this call, I just thought about what a change it's been from the market lows of literally a year ago, uh, maybe a week ago, I think it was March 23rd of 2020, where the market lows and just the incredible market run up we've seen in, in a year and just the change in mood that we've seen over the course of the year. Um, so uh, first of all, just, you know, very fortunate for everyone that the market is up quite a bit. And I think you hit the the nail on the head there in terms of rotation. What we've seen over the last three to six months has been a pretty strong rotation into the smaller end of the market, into the value uh, of the market. And frankly, I would say we don't talk about it as much, but uh, been quite a big run up in, um, in international stocks over the last three to six months. So uh, those are some of the trends we're noticing, obviously, over the last uh, year also, there's been quite a bit of interest in things like thematic investing and some of the technology stocks. But I think over the last three to six months, what's been uh, really on the forefront has been this rotation, a little bit away from growth towards value, as you mentioned, and rotation into some of the smaller, uh, smaller names and smaller stocks in the marketplace. So talking about rotation into value, uh, the Russell 1000 value index is up about 13% this year, whereas the Russell 1000 growth index is almost flat, up just about 1%. And this is probably the widest margin in about two decades because for the last so many years, growth has just been trouncing value. So do you think cyclical value stocks have more room to run? I mean, I, I think I do. I think one of the reasons we're seeing this, uh, one of the reasons we saw, we saw such a big difference uh, last year. Uh, and part of the reason, I think, was not only growth versus value, but physical versus virtual. Uh, last year was certainly a year where uh, people were anticipating, investors were anticipating uh, virtual stocks. And by those, you know, predominantly technology type stocks had uh, certainly had their moment in the sun. But as we're looking forward to the reopening of the economy here, and we were just discussing the vaccine situation before we got on the air, uh, certainly placed a more favorable environment for, you know, physical stocks, whether it be shipping or uh, real goods or consumer stocks, or maybe going forward, even, you know, one day we could hope to travel. Uh, some of those value stocks going to look uh, certainly more attractive as we anticipate more and more reopening over the next, you know, three to nine months. So I'll certainly see a, a potential for a continued uh, rally in the value segment of the market. So as you mentioned, we are talking on the 31st of March and uh, technology stocks are seem to be back in favor today. The Nasdaq is up almost 2% today, but uh, it has been a relative underperformer uh, because technology stocks are particularly sensitive to rising rates. And sure. rates have been slowly inching up this year. 
And uh, now heading into the second quarter, investors will be watching interest rates uh, closely, and they'll also be watching the vaccine rollout and earnings. Uh, so tell us what investors should expect from the second quarter and also from the remainder of 2021. Well, I guess uh, just in terms of thinking about the rest of the year, I think it is critically important to be watching uh, interest rates here. Um, they have been advancing obviously from very, very deep lows into last year. So some of this is just trend, but levels are still quite low. But uh, I think monitoring inflation expectations is going to be critically important. We have seen not only rotation into value, but I think one other indication of uh, heightened inflation and activity is also some of the run-up we've seen in uh, all sorts of commodities and uh, commodity ETFs even. Um, so those are, those are both areas we expect to see uh, continued momentum in. Um, we mentioned interest rates as one area. Earnings, obviously, across the, the board are going to be critical to monitor. Um, but I think we're seeing, at least in the first quarter, the trends, some of the trends that we expect to play out over the rest of the year, right? So that continued shift, as I mentioned, into value, that continued shift into some of the smaller uh, segments of the market. And as I mentioned before, I think it'd be critically important uh, for investors to monitor uh, how much of their portfolio they're devoting to uh, international names and international stocks, um, depending on how vaccine rollouts play out across the across the globe here. I think we're seeing quite a bit of dispersion uh, across markets and uh, potential, potential for some gains here in places like emerging markets, which have uh, had a nice run in the last few months. Right. Now, focusing on uh, smaller and value stocks. Let's talk about uh, the style box and uh, size investing. And uh, recently, iShares implemented some product enhancement uh, to Morningstar US equity style box uh, suite. Uh, talk to us a little bit about those changes and why did you implement those changes? Yeah, so let me just start from the beginning. When we talk about style box investing here at BlackRock with our iShares, we're really talking about you know building blocks for the U.S. equity portion of uh, investors' portfolios. We offer style box investing, and when I mean style box, I mean typically built around nine boxes in a in a in in each of these families. And you know you should think about them as growth, blend, and value on the one hand, and then large cap, mid cap, and small cap on the other end. So typically talking about style and size, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, you know, we have three families of Stylebox um, ETFs. We have a Russell Stylebox, we have an S&P Stylebox, and we've been partnering with Morningstar for you know, over 20 years on their Stylebox. Uh, Morningstar is the creator of the Stylebox. So when they approached us that they were looking to change their indices uh, last year, we were more than excited to work with them to adjust their uh, their style box family. Um, so we were responding to them. I think that's critical to know. I think, um, you know, not to get too technical about it, but the way the Morningstar style box worked previously is if you wanted to build a U.S. equity portfolio with them, you had to sample from each of the nine boxes to cover the entire uh, U.S. universe. What they've done now is they've created a true blend category down the middle so that investors, depending on whether they have views around growth and value or views around size, can actually build the U.S. equity portfolio a lot more efficiently uh, using only potentially three or even uh, two boxes in the, um, in the nine box range. So, um, And then I think, uh, importantly, we see more and more investors and advisors building portfolios with the style box and building models with the style box that so we want to be to be there for investors uh, as they build new models and give them as much choice with which to build those models as possible. So uh, talk to us a little bit more about style investing in particular and uh, uh, looking at the suite, what kind of exposures these ETFs provide to investors? Yeah, I think you know, what's interesting is we're trying to create uh, tools for investors to build portfolios that express their own points of view and how they like to build portfolios. So we've seen investors use Stylebox uh, ETFs in a variety of ways. Some investors, they want to be able to allocate efficiently between large cap and small cap, and they think it's important to 
you know, maybe balance those weightings over time, rebalance them over time. So some of them will use a large cap ETF uh, in, on the one hand and then a small cap ETF on the other hand, and they will uh, balance those out. Um, that's one way of using them. Other investors actually think about size and uh, style, growth and value. So they might build, um, they might actually, I know one investor, they, with the way they build their portfolios, they take growth and value on the large cap to build their portfolio. And then we'll plug in small and mid cap only in a blend, uh, in a blend kind of style, and they won't choose between growth and value at the smaller end of the, of the range. And then finally, there are other investors who want to be able to make size and style distinctions across the full range. So they will use growth and value at the large cap, at the mid cap, um, also at the small cap end of the spectrum. So they might use six ETFs, you know, three. Three large caps, uh, sorry, three um, growth ETFs and three style ETFs. So what we're trying to be able to do is provide the tools that are necessary for uh, investors to build the portfolios that they want to build at attractive expense ratios with the, ex with the exact exposures that they want, uh, as opposed to prescribing them only to uh, a single family or a single way of investing. What we're really here to do, be able to do is provide them with uh, the choices that work for them. So how do these style box ETF fit within the overall portfolio? Talk to us about the role of style ETFs in an investor's portfolio. Yeah, I mean, what we see typically most U.S. investors, uh, you know, depending on how they're building their portfolios, but, you know, U.S. investor, U.S. advisor portfolios that we see hold anywhere from, you know, 60 to 80 percent of their equity portfolio in uh in um, U.S. equities, um, and the, I hesitate to use the word dominant, but the predominant maybe uh, way they build their portfolios is through the style box. They will take, uh, you know, the bulk of that position in large caps. Um, sometimes what they do is they'll just build the blend, um, use the blend things like um, some of our mainstream names, whether it's Russell, Morningstar, or uh, S and P. And then um, plug in a small cap to be a uh, portion of that. And that might, that indexing strategy for large caps, mid cap, and small caps may take uh, 50, 60 percent of that uh, 100 percent of US equities. And then they might complement that with uh, single names that they have conviction around, uh, thematic ETFs that they might have conviction around, or specific um, ESG portfolios that they want to uh, build them around. But predominantly, um, these types of style box tools are what constitute the bulk of uh, investors' portfolios. They also constitute the bulk of the assets that we have uh, in our equity uh, lineup. Well, m many of them, you know, our, our largest ETF is our S&P 500 ETF. But, um, so this is pr the predominant way that investors and, and their advisors are building portfolios, especially ones that uh, favor index style approaches. Can you talk a little bit about best practices that investors should be aware of when building a portfolio of style ETFs? I think one of the things uh, that is important to consider is to build these things with a little bit of consistency. So uh, the extent to which they're uh, building with the family, they should potentially stick with that family. So some investors favor the Russell type construction, which has a set number of names as distinct, for example, from the the Morningstar suite that we just uh, relaunched, essentially, which has a percentage of the name. So uh, I think it's important, by and large, to be consistent and stick within a family. That would be one thing uh, we recommend. Now, we do have investors who cross maybe Russell with Morningstar, or cross with Russell and S&P, but they have the, they're certainly aware of the analytics and some of the differences across those things. So I think, you know, trying to be consistent, but at a minimum, being conscious of some of the biases as you build uh, across families. Um, I think it's important to recognize when there are overlaps across some of the positions. So the extent to which someone's using a blend position with a growth position, I think, um, and we provide some of these services to uh, the advisors that work with us. Um, so I think being conscious around um, around the um, overlaps between the different uh, different products, and then um, you know, I think the other thing for individual investors uh, is important is. Um, to think through what are the relative benchmarks and uh, how much of the, you know, when they're buying small cap stocks, which tend to be, you know, less than 10% of the market, some investors get excited about those, but 
you know, what are the benchmarks that you should really be uh, targeting and being only above or below that benchmark in a conscious way and not end up, um, you know, with 20, 30, 40 percent small caps, uh, even though they constitute only 10 percent of the market. So normally when we talk about styles, we focus on style and size. We focus on large cap and small caps. And mid cap is an area which is often ignored by investors. But looking at the longer term, we see that mid caps have actually outperformed both the large caps and small caps. So talk to a little to talk to us a little bit about the role of mid caps in a portfolio and uh, also about the mid cap uh, ETFs in the suite. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. I think each of the style families actually takes uh, a little bit of different uh, approach to them. So, for example, in the Russell style box that we have, the mid cap is actually uh, inside of the Russell 1000. So, I think it's important to think through. Uh, how you want to approach if you want a specific allocation to mid caps. Uh, mid caps tended to be, at least in the last little while, a nice medium between some of the risk associated with small caps um, and getting some of that potential premium for outperformance. Uh, in the S and P range, the mid cap is actually different, right? So you have a 500, a 400, and then a 600. So you're getting a specific exposure to the mid cap. In this new Morningstar fund. Uh, it's a little bit closer to the Russell construction, where uh, the mid cap is, you know, in some sense part of the large mid uh, of the portfolio. So there, it's important to think through how one wants to allocate to mid caps as distinct from uh, from some of the large caps. So looking at these style ETFs in particular at the suite, uh, which areas you are most positive on for the second quarter and beyond? Yeah, no, I think I'll just reiterate some of the statements I made earlier. I think um, in general, we've seen quite a rotation into uh, value. And I think uh, investors' portfolios over the last five, 10 years, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning of the call, may be underweight value in their portfolio. So I think potentially reallocating uh, a little bit uh, into value if, um, if investors' portfolios have swung uh, too far into growth over the last five, 10 years, I think is a useful thing for investors to think about coming into the second quarter. I think the other thing is for a long time, uh, just as we've seen the rally last last little while in small caps, I think investors' portfolios uh, you know, have gravitated to be pretty concentrated in a small set of large cap stocks. So I think it is worthwhile for investors to think about you know, how far away are they from, you know, that kind of 10% figure I mentioned in small caps uh, is another area to, to start thinking about and uh, rebalancing portfolios as they head here into the second quarter. Okay, switching gears a little bit, I also wanted to talk about sectors. Uh, so technology was the best performing sector last year and over the past so many years, as we discussed that growth stocks did very well during this uh, bull market. Uh, and energy, which was which is which was one of the worst performers over the past decade, is actually the best performing sector this year. Uh, energy has come down a little bit over the past week or so. And financials is another area which had not done very well in the past few years. And it is the second best performing sector this year. And that is because banks benefit from rising interest rates. Sure. Uh, so head heading into the second quarter, uh, which sectors you are most positive on? You know, I think Back to physical assets, areas that are have physical assets. We talked a little bit today, uh, the last few days, the president has been talking about his infrastructure plan, things like that. So I think, you know, we have seen a run up in commodity prices, which bodes well for energy. I think uh, you mentioned financials related to interest rates. That seems like a trend that's going to continue for quite a uh, while. But I also think uh, areas that stand to benefit are areas that uh, are potentially even housing and infrastructure, which would you know, assuming this plan goes through in the next little while, our areas that are going to see uh, significant investment and uh, significant spending. So, those are some areas. Although the market timing of those things always is uh, always is challenging. 
Yeah, definitely. Talking about the market timing, and uh, you mentioned uh, thematic investing earlier in our discussion. Uh, thematic ETFs were very popular last year because some of the themes like work from home, cloud computing, video gaming, uh, cyber securities, these really benefited from trends which were driven by the pandemic. Uh, so is there any particular theme which you think will continue to do well this year too? You know, um, we have built a suite of products around, you know, what some people call thematics. We've built them around something called megatrends. Uh, we are trying to position these things for the long term and not necessarily capture, you know, short term gyrations in the market. Um, so we see some of these trends as persisting for, you know, quite a bit a long time. I'll just give you an example of one where we have which attracted a lot of interest last year, which was our product uh, iDNA. Uh, it's uh, around immunology and genomics, and obviously it's had its moment in the sun here and discussion around um, uh, vaccines and whatnot. And you see some of the stocks in there. Um, <clears throat> I've been participating in that trend, but uh, you know, we, liked, we believe that these are trends that are going to persist over a long time. They're going to see volatility here in, in the short term, but uh, you know, I think what's important about thematic investing, which is kind of a new, in a way, a new way of thinking about these things. And it's not only in public equities. We've seen uh, private equity players try and um, orient their investors a little bit towards more towards growth and themes. But I think it's important to have conviction over the longer term when it comes to investing in themes, uh, as opposed to uh, you know, maybe short term gyrations in three months and a little bit, you know, what some of my colleagues call, uh, are more speculative. So I think over the long term, while, you know, technology, some of the technology plays have been more challenged here. I think some of the trends are uh, pretty inexorable or, you know, things that we expect to continue for a long time. We already mentioned um, uh, this immunology and genomics, but I would talk about robotics as well as in areas that are um, prime for the long term. Uh, we've talked about the, the changes that are happening in the in the auto industry and a movement away to to electric and even self driving vehicles. So, I think when you come to thematic investing, it's important to have conviction that these trends are going to persist for five or ten years, and not um, and not just focus on maybe short term thematic plays. If that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Very interesting. And uh, that's all we have time for today, Chad. Thanks again okay. for joining us. Oh, yeah, happy to. Thanks for listening. If you want to learn more about these ETFs, please visit the ETF section of zax.com. If you like our show, please leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. And also make sure to subscribe so that you do not miss any episode. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please email podcast at sex.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.